hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, on behalf of my lovely, sweet patootie wife, Alice, and myself, and Mark, we want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we continue on in the study that we've been doing for the last couple of, few weeks, uh, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And we're going to pick that up again today. We left off on, we're in the first chapter, and we left off last week and uh, going into, getting ready to go into verse 18. So that's where we're going to start today, right after Brother Mark asks for God's blessing on our time together. Yes. Oh Lord, open up your word to our hearts and to our minds, that we might see what you want to, want us to proclaim. Amen. 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 All right. All right, so I'm going to start at Ephesians 1.18, where Paul wrote, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the, in, in the saints. The eyes of your heart. Did you know that your eyes have heart? No. Did you know that your heart had eyes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. The, by the way, uh, this is one of the very, very few places that I know of in scriptures that I use where the Greek in the King James differs from the Greek in most of the newer translations. Mm. Uh, the King James talks about that your understanding would be enlightened. But this is certainly a better translation of the word because the word here, the Greek word is cardia. Mm. Like cardiac, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cardiac. okay. Mm -hmm. That's because it is the word for heart. All right. The heart is the most important organ in the human body. I mean, you can you can lose other organs, you lose the heart, and you're probably in significant trouble. Okay. And that's the first mm -hmm. organ that's uh, formed in a newborn. That is the baby. first organ that is formed after conception is a heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, because it requires it. You know, it says in Levit Leviticus that the life is in the blood. Yes. Well, it's the heart that pumps that life-giving blood to all of the rest of the body. Okay? Mm -hmm. So bear that in mind. That's important, right? That It's the core of life. Yes. Okay? And by the way, that word core, yes. in, in, well, in French and Latin, that's, where, that's the word for heart, right? But does your heart have eyes? That's the question. Your heart is the only thing that makes it possible to see anything clearly. Mm. Let me explain what I mean by that. Well, it says, for with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. Mm -hmm. And with the mouth, he confess and confesses, resulting in salvation, Romans 10.10. 10. So faith is about believe what you believe in your heart, right? Yes. Not in your mind, in your heart. It has to start in your heart. The heart pumps life into the rest of the, the rest of the body. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't see God without faith, which resides in the heart. And without that faith, you could look at Jesus. You could look. I mean, you could stand an inch away from Jesus and look straight at him, but you never see the Son of God. You never see the King of Kings. You never recognize the Lord of Lords. I mean, isn't that what happened all the time? In That's Matthew 13, 13, Jesus said to the people, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing, they do not see. And while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. So you're not going to see anything spiritually unless you're seeing it with your heart, the eyes of your heart. So based on the truth of what Solomon said, okay, in the book of Proverbs, he said, where there is no vision, the people perish, Proverbs 29, 18. Now, I used to do seminars on biblical principles for, for personal and professional growth, right? And it was a two-day seminar. And the foundation, one of the foundational truths or points of that seminar right in the beginning was that, that vision is about the ability to see with your heart what you cannot see with your eyes. You have to have that kind of vision, right? David knew that if you're going to have that vision, the Lord required a clean heart. So he prayed, create me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me, Psalm 51.10. You see, we need to bear in mind 
It's the fact that we need a heart of flesh rather than the heart of stone. Because hard-hearted people don't, cannot see God. So the Lord met that need for those who believe and will receive, because he spoke to the prophet Ezekiel and said, and I will give them a heart and put a new heart with a new spirit within them. And I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. Then they will be my people and I shall be their God. Ezekiel 11, 19 and 20. That makes so much sense to his statement to the um, Nicodemus that you must, must be born, born again. again. Yes. Because when we're when we're born, we're not born with eyes of the heart. Our hearts don't have mm-hmm. eyes. So you have to be born again to get those eyes. Yeah, from amen. The heart, amen. That new heart. Right. So now but remember what I said earlier, that if you're not operating in faith, and faith is about what you've believed in your heart, right? Then you are a natural man. Or woman, okay, and you cannot, you will not accept the things of the Spirit of God. That's exactly what Paul wrote in First Corinthians two fourteen. So the Lord desires, and the Apostle Paul prayed that we would, and this is going back to the verse in Ephesians, that we will know the hope of His calling. Right, the believing heart is the core of our lives. The hope is the encouragement that holds us fast in the storms of life. That's why it says in Hebrews 6.19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast. It holds you solid, right? No matter what things look like at the moment, remember, better yet, treasure Mm -hmm. what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 when he said, therefore, we do not lose heart But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Let's go to Hebrews 11. I mean, that's the faith is about the assurance of things Hopefully we're not seen, right? So in that verse, there were 18, goes on and says, and the riches of the glory of his inheritance. The glory of his inheritance. That's the eternity that is prepared for us. That's why, you know, again, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul said, but just as it is written, things which the eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. This is the inheritance. Okay, this outer flesh, that's what we just read. You know, he said, it's, it's perishing. I mean, you can sit here and look at me. God's done some miraculous healings for me in my life. But I'm sitting here rotting away. I'm sitting here perishing as you look at me. We all are. Absolutely. But we have an inheritance. And that inheritance is eternal life, Right. Think about this. In seven days, right, God created everything out of nothing. Everything. Everything that you can see, the mountains, the sky, the sun, the moon, the stars, the oceans, the birds, the puppy dogs and kitty cats, the people that walk on here. Everything in seven days, God created them. He spoke it into existence. Now he's been going for 2,000 years to prepare a place for us in eternity. This is the inheritance, right? He said, in my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. John 14, 2. He's preparing a place for us. If he could do this in seven days, Mm -hmm. imagine what he could do in 2000. Oh. We can't imagine. No, we can't. That's the thing. Eye is not seen, ear is not heard. But hallelujah, down in our spirit, there's a hope of what awaits us. Here and now, we are, like the old hymn, a hymn that I really love, a poor wayfaring stranger. Yes. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger wandering through this world of woe. Well, you know what? That's, that's true, but we are citizens of heaven, mm-hmm. strangers in a strange land. That's what Paul wrote in Philippians, Philippians 3, 20 and 21. He said, for our citizenship is in heaven, 
from which also we eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. He's got the power to change us. He said, I, I hope you, you know what? You want to be excited. I'm looking forward to this. It's not about, yes, God deals with, loves us, and takes care of us in the here and now. But I'm looking forward to that day when I will fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'm going to go on to the next verse, Ephesians 119. And what is the, he wants us to know, what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. The surpassing greatness of his power. You know, Jesus had just finished teaching the Sermon on the Mount. And he came down from the mountain and performed some amazing, amazing miracles. Healing a leopard, healing the servant of the centurion with just a word, not even going, just sending a word, right? Healing, I mean, healing Peter's mother-in-law with a single, a simple touch, it says, right? He was casting out demons. This is all in Matthew chapter 8, by the way. Go read it. And then he got into a boat with the apostles to cross the Sea of Galilee when a storm arose. You probably know this account, right? So in Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27, it says, When he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with the waves. But Jesus himself was asleep. <laughs> and they came to him and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. The next verse says, The men were amazed and said, What kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? In the what chapter? Matthew chapter 8. 23. Yeah, starting in 23, right? In the littleness of their faith, they had thought there were limits to his power. They'd just seen him do all these miracles. Yes. But now they're astounded that he can command the sea and the waves, the sea and the wind and the waves, right? They thought his power was limited. The surpassing greatness is what it's talking about. The exceeding greatness, as the King James says, of his power. For nothing will be impossible with God, it says in Luke 137. Nothing is impossible with God. However, in his own hometown, in Jesus' hometown, it says, this I'm reading from Mark 6, and he could do no miracle there except that he lays, laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching. There is no limit to God's power, but we can limit what we're ready to receive. That's an important truth. Our, un our unbelief can limit what he will do to bless us in our lives. What he'll do in our lives because of the surpassing greatness of his power. Because as the verse says, it's towards us who to those who to believe. You can stop the power of God in your yeah, life if you don't believe. Right. Unbelief. And where does belief reside? In, in the heart. heart. Where is unbelief? It is absent from the heart. It's absent from your... You can say you believe all day long, but if it's not your heart that believes and it results in action... You can say it with your lips, but the heart, like you said, is far from... So get your heart right and believe. Believe what he said. Not what you want, not what you think, but believe what he said, all right? Because he watches over his word to perform it. So then in verse 20, Ephesians 1.20, he said, which he, now that's the father of glory, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. He raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Philippians 3, verses 7 through 10 says this. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. 
More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but done so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. You want to know the power of God? Are you, are you willing to know the, the fellowship of his sufferings? Jesus said, count the cost. I'm telling you, I'm telling you the truth. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to make ridiculous, wild promises that you can do whatever you want, act the way any way you want, live any way you want, and expect to get all of the blessings of God. You can't. And, and maybe you ought to take a little homework assignment and go read Deuteronomy chapter 28. Yes. The whole thing. The front part with the blessings and the second part with the not blessings. The curses. That's another word of curses. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now Jesus is seated because it says that the Father seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now that's truly a, a wonderful, wonderful truth. And all the more exciting when the apostle states that the Father has seated us with Jesus there in heavenly places, as it says in the next chapter, which we'll get to sometime, right? We've been seated with Jesus in heavenly places. You know, one of the other things I used to say in the seminar, talking about, it has a lot to do with your perspective, the way you see things, all right? And it, you can see things in the natural, and you can see things through the eyes of your heart, the faith that God has given you. And that's perspective, the way you see things. And I, I used to tell the story that I lived, when I was a child, I lived one block away from the Empire State Building in Midtown Manhattan. And my mother used to take me over to the Empire State Building. We'd go over maybe once a week, and we'd go up to the, near the observation deck. They had a cafeteria up high and have lunch. But I can remember as a little kid standing at the foot of the Empire State Building, which at the time was the tallest building in the world. And looking up, and you, you look up, and you think that thing goes on forever and ever and ever. Mm -hmm. But I've flown in and out of New York. I flew in the Navy, and, I, I you know, you're 35,000 feet, 40,000 feet, and you look down at the Empire State Building, and all you can say is, what Empire State Building? It's all about your perspective. That's right. So if you're down in the gutter, if you're down in those low places, and you look up at your problems, it looks like they go on forever and ever and ever. But you see, you're not supposed to be down in the gutter mm -hmm. you are seated with christ in heavenly places that's higher than 35 40 000 feet yep, it is. and you should look down and say what problem all right in verse 21 flying right along it says far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come jesus christ his power is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, right? Mm -hmm. You know that a dog catcher in town, in a town, has rule and authority and power and dominion over dogs and their owners. Yes. In that town, right? Yes. But then there's a mayor in that town who has rule and authority and power and dominion over the dog catcher in that town. Mm -hmm. And of course, even more. But also, then there's the governor. And the governor of the state, guaranteed, has rule and authority and power and dominion over that mayor. See how this works here? Yes. God is a God of good order. Absolutely. But that governor must recognize the fact that there is a president, a senate, and a congress that has rule and authority and power and dominion over him or her. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, that governor is in rebellion. Mm -hmm. So, there you, I'm taking it up. I'm, yeah. I'm, I, you know, I'm trying to reduce it to the to the right. ridiculous. Yeah. But so you see, but it's a truth. The dog catcher has authority, mm -hmm. but somebody has authority over him, and he has to recognize it. Yes. He has to he has to respect that. He has to live by it. Same goes up all, down, all, all, the all the way up the line. 
And the person that okay. uh, yeah. is going to go to punch his pilot? No, I'm not, not yet, Mark. Well, what I want to go with this is because you say you don't want to go into politics. Well, maybe this is getting into politics, but maybe you better pay attention to what I say then. Because what I'm saying is what the Word of God says. Okay? Don't forget that the, the President, the Senate, and the Congress must recognize that there is somebody who has rule and authority and power and dominion over them, far above them, Jesus the Christ, who is seated in heavenly places. That's right. Otherwise, if they don't acknowledge that, they are in rebellion. God is a God of good order. So in spite of what you may think about politics, it's not the people that have authority over the, 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 the people. The, the, it's God that has authority over everybody. Yes. And that takes us to Pontius Pilate. Because Pontius Pilate stood or had Jesus standing in front of him, and he couldn't understand Jesus Christ because he, he's a, he is about to bring him to the worst kind of death that the Romans could conceive of, that crucifixion. And Jesus doesn't seem flustered. Jesus doesn't seem troubled. So Pontius Pilate says, don't you understand I have the power to put you to death this way? And Jesus said, you'd have no power. You'd have no authority. You'd have no rule. You'd have no dominion. You'd have, I'm taking it from this, right? Unless my father in heaven gave it to you. Amen. All authority flows from the father down. All authority flows from the father down. And if you have in politics, which is the case in most, most of the world, probably in all of the world, that if you have these politicians and they don't recognize the authority over them, they don't recognize the authority of Jesus Christ, they are simply in rebellion. Mm -hmm. They are in rebellion. And you know what? God spoke to the prophet Samuel and said, rebellion is as witchcraft. It's a sin of witchcraft. That's 1 Samuel 15, 23. And if in rebellion, they're still under somebody's rule and authority and power and dominion. You know who? We know that we are of God, it says in 1 John 5, 19. And that the whole world, we're of God, but the whole world? lies in the power of the evil one. They're subject to the devil. Because you know what? You are, you're, you're going to serve somebody. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, no man can serve two masters, but everybody's going to serve somebody. Mm -hmm. And it says in Romans 6.16, 6, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you're slaves of the one whom you obey? either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Praise God. I got to tell you, I mean, it's just the simple fact of the matter is you, you serve. If you're not serving God, you're serving the devil. That's right. It's that simple. It's black and white. It is black and white. There's no gray. No gray. No middle ground. No fence to sit on. And at the end, I promise you this, this is the word of God. And if you can't see this with the eyes of your heart, you're missing the point. Everybody will recognize the one. Mm -hmm. The one whose name is above all names. Everybody will recognize the one whom the Father has made to be far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. That's what it says. God has made Jesus Christ the one who's above all authority. All, has given him all authority, all power and dominion over every name that is named. Who is it? It's Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. I mean, I, I pray you know that, right? In Philippians, Paul writes this in chapter 2. Speaking of Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, Every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. 
and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Satan is going to bow and confess that Jesus is Lord yes. to the glory of God the Father. Mm -hmm. Adolf Hitler's name anyway. Everybody will is going to bow down and confess Jesus Christ to be Lord of all. Okay? I promise you that it's better to start doing it now than later. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, really. I mean, these are the things that we have to come to know. And you come to know these by your heart relationship with God, with Jesus Christ and with God the Father. It's about what's in your heart. It's not just faith that resides in your heart. It's the love of God that has been poured into your heart that goes with it. You got to check your heart. Yes. You, you, Give your heart to Jesus. Let him fix it. All of your heart. That's right. You have to be wholehearted in your love of God. He wants all. He demands all. Mm -hmm. he, he demands all. You can't, you can't be a part-time Christian. You can't give part of your love, part of your attraction to God, and part for the things of the world, the, the world and the things of the world. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus was saying in the Sermon on the Mount. You'll love one and hate the other. That's right. And he was talking about mammon. He's talking about wealth. He's talking about the things of the world. You're either going to you're either going to love God or you're going to love the world and the things of the world. And one will lead you to the pits of hell, and one will lead you to eternal life and that inheritance that is there for the children of God. To the Father's mansion. But it's all about what's in your heart. How does something get into your heart? Well, what do you set your heart upon? What do you set your heart upon? I, I, is your heart set upon the world and the things of the world? Or is your heart set upon God? Do me a favor, and nice and loud, read Psalm, let's see, 73, verse 25. Psalm 73, verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And besides thee, I desire nothing on earth. Keep going. Yeah. Besides thee, I desire nothing on earth. When do you get to the place where all that matters in your life? Oh, yeah, think, because you know what? You, 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 it's easy to be deceived by the devil who thinks, well, you know what? I got to take care of the other things. I got to do this and that. But the word of God, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus Christ said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All, all the rest will be added unto you. We have to have a heart totally, solely fixed on the Lord God, on Jesus Christ. And we have to let that love that he's poured into our heart flow out of our heart to touch other lives. Otherwise, you are going to miss the abundant life that God has in store for you. I don't know what else to tell you. So I think that's where we'll stop and pick it up next week. But, but do think about this. Politics they're not fixed on the, the instruction of God coming down, then what what are they being led by? And I was thinking about the fact that the ministry of the government is to protect the people from the evildoers. That's the ministry of the That's government. That's the ministry of the government. But if they're not submitting to God, they can't fulfill their ministry. They won't fulfill their ministry. One of the things that you, where you could have gone in this is um, the president is not an, an, answerable to God, but he is. He might think he's answerable toward the people, and that's a false alternative. That's what he said. It's, it's not rule from the bottom up. Right. It's, it's heresy is what yeah. it is. Yeah. It's heresy. Authority does not flow from the bottom up, but that's exactly, what the, exactly what the Constitution of the United States right. says. That authority flows from the bottom. Up. So from the get go, the, 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 the people in power out, get their get their authority order. from the people under them, mm -hmm. from that, the consent of the governed. That is exactly opposite of what God says. It's out of order. Think about it. Think about it, and think about your involvement. So, Father, I just pray that you would give us a clean heart, Lord. That you would cleanse our hearts, Lord God. That anything in our heart that doesn't belong there, that separates us from you, Lord God, that you would expose to us. 
And Lord, that we would come to, to desire that change, that we would be able to see you clearly, that we would be able to hear your voice clearly, listening and seeing through that part that you've given us. We praise you and thank you for your word, your life-giving word, your encouraging word, your instruction that comes from your word. And Lord, we just ask that, that through this coming week, that you would use us for the glory of your name. Lord, that people would see your son, Jesus Christ, in our lives. I ask that, Father, in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, till next week, God bless you and goodbye. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mind.